was one time when with one of the other villages I said look we're going to come and do this I don't want anybody else shooting us because they decided to mortar us and shoot us as we were coming in or shoot at us um, which they thought was incredibly funny and I said look I don't want any more of that happening you know and listen guys if that does happen my mother is going to come here from England and she's going to be really angry with you of course the boys you know, the, the guys just you know okay fine but the women behind just started laughing you know yeah, he's, he's threatened them with his mother you know so and that again going on to what I did after I left the military when you're talking about sort of key messages yeah. and your audiences you know getting it right there for all of the stakeholders I think is very very important that's Mark Harris And this is the All Things Risk Podcast. Welcome back, or welcome to the All Things Risk Podcast. I'm Ben Catanio. I'm your host, and this is my show where we go long form and use the lenses of risk and uncertainty to understand ourselves and our world a little bit better. Today's conversation is one in which we get into what to do when things go wrong. And we cover that by exploring the world of acute crisis management and crisis communication. And we're talking about situations that often feature in action movie plots, to be quite frank. And I'm delighted to bring you my conversation with a friend and former colleague of mine, Mark Harris. Mark is a crisis management and crisis communications expert with several decades of experience working at the forefront of these areas. And so what kinds of crises are we talking about here? Well, Mark has worked on over 150 incidents of kidnapping, extortion, and hostage taking around the world, and 19 cases of vessel hijack, the majority of which were undertaken by Somali pirates. Prior to that, Mark served for 14 years as an officer in the British Army, and as you'll hear, he saw service in Germany during the fall of the Berlin Wall. He was part of the UN peacekeeping contingent in Cyprus, and as a military observer in Cambodia when he and his team, as you will also hear, were taken hostage by the Khmer Rouge. So, He obviously knows of what he speaks and his experience helping organizations and individuals deal with these types of acute crises offers a number of lessons that are applicable to a range of wider contexts. We talk about all that, including the dynamics of kidnapping, crisis communication, and the importance of crisis preparedness, Mark's time in the military, including in Germany and Cambodia, and much more. So let's get into it. Here is Mark Harris. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Roger Deepak. Good to see you. This is the first in-person podcast recording I think I've done since the end of the pandemic. Oh, brilliant. Good. Yeah, so it's wonderful to... <laughs> Be face to face. It is a different vibe. So yeah, thank yeah. you for Certainly. meeting me. So look, we're going to have a really interesting conversation about crisis management and pressure and risk in the moment and all that good stuff. But before we do that, I'd love for you to give a little bit of a background to who you are, yeah. uh, what you do, because I think it's really interesting. And particularly, you were in the army for many years and what got you into a military career so what got me into the military career was essentially i came from a military family yeah. uh, my father was in the military my eldest brother was in the military another brother was in the french foreign legion um so it was it was pretty natural although my father did his best to try and dissuade me and said it wasn't quite you know the military that i'd known as an as an army brat but uh, anyway, I, I i did join the uh, military in uh, 1980 I uh, was commissioned uh, and joined uh, one of our cavalry regiments, uh, 59th Kings Royal Zars, and did 14 years um, in the army, uh, finishing the rank of major. And I had a really, really good time, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, the One of my biggest takeaways was actually the interaction you'd have with the soldiers themselves, the other ranks. Um, and they were 
I mean, exceptionally good at what they did from a professional point of view, but the majority of them, the vast majority of them were actually very good company as well um, and amusing, uh, which always helps sometimes when you're sat in a tank at two o'clock in the morning and it's raining and it's very cold and everything like You always need a little bit of a joke or some, yeah, black humour. But uh, no, that was, that was great. Um, and I think probably sort of highlights of my 14 years um, probably were two. I had the good fortune to be away from what we describe as regimental duty in 1989 as a staff officer in Berlin, in the Allied Staff Berlin. And I arrived in February of 1989, uh, knowing that we were surrounded by uh, the Soviet uh, army and also the National National Volksarmee from the German Democratic Republic. And then someone pulled the wall down in November of that year. And to be there in Berlin through that time was i mean it was just it was watching history being made um and it was absolutely fantastic from that point of view and also i continued there as we went through the transition so unification and also the allied staff berlin who essentially were the sort of the military command in charge of west berlin actually formally signing over the letter back to the west berlin senate and the federal republic of germany sort of hanging berlin back to sort of civilian rule where yeah the berlin senate did sort of um do do their bit there but uh and that was absolutely wow. amazing from that point of view as i said sort of overnight that was it it changed and history was being rewritten to a degree did yeah. you guys have any inkling that it was my yeah my 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 staff job uh was described as the staff captain so so2 sorry so3 um g2 so intelligence uh and so we worked to an american half colonel and myself and a french counterpart were his go-to guys to go and sort of run around and find stuff out from people so we knew that throughout that summer east germany was hemorrhaging its citizens through the poorest borders now of Hungary, Czech Republic, etc., etc., so they they were getting out now, and there were a lot of demonstrations in Leipzig, Dresden, Berlin, but still, I I was fortunate to deliver the briefing to what was described as the Allied Commandeur, so the three Allied generals, the French, the American, and British generals, and it was the British general, General Robert Corbett, who asked me at the end of it, Mark, so great summary of what's happening in East East Germany. Thank you for that, but what do you think is going to happen? And I was very upfront. I said, I'm sorry, General, we really don't know. And that was on, I think it was at the end of October. Uh, so then we went into November and it was November the 9th, the wall came down. So no, we, we knew something had to give, but exactly what would happen, how it would come out. No, I don't think, we'd, I don't think anybody really knew at all. Uh, and in fact, I think there is, you know, there is the theory, I say theory, I think it's been fairly well documented. Actually, it was it was not supposed to have happened. They were going to announce that people could travel, but then they were going to mm. tell them about the rules of it, but the guy couldn't read what the rules were or didn't understand. So, well, okay, travel. And that was it. Mm. Wow. So, I mean, that that was, I said, one of my, I mean, I had a lot of fun time, as I said, but, you know, that was, that was one of the highlights. And the other one was I had the good fortunes again to um, join the United Nations mission in uh, Cambodia. Uh, the United Nations Transitory Authority in Cambodia, I think it was, UNTAC. Um, and so essentially Cambodia, just sort of, you know, not declared, but, you know, essentially was, was bankrupt from one of the, not bankrupt, but, you know, it, it was, it was in, mm. it was in bits after, you know, the Vietnamese, after the Khmer Rouge, Vietnamese invasion, et cetera, et cetera. And I think probably from my point of view, I'd, I'd done UN with, in Cyprus and things like that, but, this was this was new. It was all groundbreaking stuff. And I think at one time there was something like twenty six thousand UN personnel in Cambodia, but not just military or UN police detachments. It was the electoral elements, sort of sorting out the uh, the elections. Uh, you had people in various ministries, you know, advising them on what they should be doing. Uh, and so it really was, you know, uh, nation building, mm. for one of a, another phrase, but also. The other side of that was that when we were driving out from Phnom Penh uh, on a long drive over a couple of days up to where we were going to be operating, which was uh, just outside of Siem Reap and north of the Tonle Sap. So it was myself. I had a Russian captain, uh, although he was Ukraine by birth, a Ukrainian by birth, uh, and a Chinese captain from the um, People's Army and a Cambodian interpreter. 
And I looked in the rearview mirror as we were driving out of Phnom Penh, and this chap had tears coming down his face. He was keeping quiet about it. And I said, you know, Moni, what, what is it? He said, this is the road that my family and I were marched out of Phnom Penh by the Khmer Rouge. And I think what was interesting when I came back after my six months there is I was showing family, friends, and one of my um, uh, one of my sister in laws was a was a nurse uh, by profession, and she just looked at the photographs and he said, "Just well, he said, look at the look at the look at their eyes, you know." And a lot of the it's very difficult, you know, uh, to judge people's age sometimes, but you know, those of the older generation said, "Look, they're just traumatized, dead eyes." And you know it was it was it was a very very interesting time and to be to be in a house in the jungle in a, in the village of Dam Deck on you know on stilts with a Russian captain and a Chinese captain and an interpreter and very few videos you know again was an interesting time uh, just sort of uh, especially now that the wall had come down and you know we're all supposed to be friends and things like that and I mean it worked out within the team you know but. And it was it was it was a it was an interesting time and also challenging time because there were various elements of the Khmer Rouge who had not bought into the ceasefire and so we we did take incoming and uh, and we had we were actually taken hostage by the Khmer Rouge and uh, my interpreter said, it was now I was now my second interpreter I think it was but uh, he um, he got very upset and I said what's the problem and he said well I think they're going to kill us. Um, which was, you know, then unfortunate because my way of speaking to Khmer Rouge was through the interpreter and he'd lost it now. So we had to try and, again, you know, we had to reboot him to, to get him going again, you know. All right, Alexa, I need you to translate this. You know? wow. um, but we, you know, we then talked through things, etc., cetera, and, and, and listened to them. And eventually, I think we managed to talk our way out of it and actually then sort of get some... Uh, momentum with them from the point of view of the peace process, which didn't go down well with Khmer Rouge a delegate in Phnom Penh, who was a guy called Q Sam Pan, and he was not impressed that we'd managed to uh, get one of their poster boys to actually say, "Okay, fine, I might want to talk to the UN some more." So that you know, but no, again, a very very interesting six months. How long were you taken hostage for? It was it was only about sort of uh, six hours or thereabouts, but. Um, <laughs> When we eventually walked out, what had ha- what we had done, we'd organised a sort of UN roadshow into uh, three Khmer Rouge villages uh, who'd agreed to do it, um, and it was it was a great success. Um, so we brought in the World Food Programme, we brought in Médecins Sans Frontières to start looking at the kids and this, that and the other. Uh, we had a New Zealand demining, uh, military mm-hmm. demining team. They came in and started talking through what people should and shouldn't be doing, et cetera, et cetera. And the electoral uh, team came in, we're talking about the elections and what they would mean and how it would be going. And, and it, it was great. It was really regular. And also, I mean, we brought in generators and, you know, we just set up a video with a whole load of cartoons for the, uh, for the kids as well. And so that it went really well. And, and that evening we said, right, okay, let's go around to the next sort of set of Khmer Rouge villages and, and try and bring them in so we can replicate this. Uh, and that's when we got into the difficulty when we were driving away from leaving a note, uh, for their leader. Uh, we were mortared, um, uh, all the way down the road. Um, it's always quite interesting when you spent 14 years in the military, mostly with weapons, and now you're six months in Cambodia unarmed because you're a peacekeeper, uh, although obviously there were elements that were armed. But as military observers, we were unarmed uh, to inspire trust in all parties that we wouldn't do anything uh, untoward. Uh, but it didn't do much for our trust and confidence when you're being mortared as you drive down the road. But, yeah, flak jackets on and helmets, and let's try and live this out. We then left the vehicle that we left the majority of the vehicles at the bottom of the road once we'd sort of, you know, once the last round had fallen, but then we walked back. I said, look, we're going to have to go back in case there are casualties because we brought that fire in on the villages along the road. Mm-hmm. All Cambodians ha- were in there. They used to have, they used to have shelters underneath their houses. They're all in their shelters. Um, but we we're about four of us and I'd got my Russian to actually reverse the vehicle. So if we could actually if incoming fire coming, we could then jump in the vehicle and he could just drive straight back down to the national route six or seven was it that was, that were, was at the bottom of the road and we then found these Khmer Rouge soldiers and we said listen guys you know we've just been up here we gave you a note and then you started mortaring us 
Uh, and they said, no, no, it wasn't us. It was Morn. And Morn was this poster boy who was uh, a real diehard Khmer Rouge mm. chap. And then suddenly we had this, you know, you get that feeling and you suddenly look around and we're surrounded by these 15, 16 year olds, all immaculately uniformed, brand new weapons. So this was a different type of Khmer Rouge mm. to Khmer Rouge we'd met who were basically tired of what they were doing. But these were real firebrands. And they then marched into the jungle. Nikolai then went down and established contact with people and told them what was happening. But we then wandered out. I was very fortunate. I, was, I didn't turn my motor roller off, so everything could be heard. Mm. And then we got back down uh, to be welcomed by a, a number of the other military observers, uh, one of whom was an American, who'd formed up two platoons of Bangladeshi infantry uh, and was, had three hip helicopters ready to fly in and come and get us. But luckily that never happened because... Sadly, from doing what I did in my sort of commercial career on kidnap and hostage taking, or the response to that, so you see that people die in rescues, which is mm. uh, which is unfortunate. So, anyway, we lived to tell the tale, mm. had a couple of cans of Tiger beer, and all felt better afterwards. <laughs> and what would you say? What went into turning that around? You said you you managed to so turn the situation around. What, yeah, I had constantly sent more letters saying I wanted to speak to him. Mm. And he'd send me death threats back. And we got to a stage and someone was busy shouting out their name. And he came out and he said, I don't want to speak to anybody. And then I heard my rank and my name being mentioned, Satborn Harris. And my interpreter sort of smiled a little bit. And I said, what's that? She says, he doesn't want to speak to anybody else. He just wants to speak to uh, Major Mark Harris. I said, okay, or Major Harris. I said, well, do you want to tell him that Major Harris is here? And that can I stand up? Because uh, we, were, we were kneeling at the time. Um... And, uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. and then then back came from him in barn, which is yeah, yes. So I sort of stood up, took my sort of uh, flak jacket off, and showed him my Khmer name tag on my uniform. And then his opening words were, you know, why why are you here? I sent you death threats. You know, I want to kill you, etc. I said, well, no, I want to engage you in the peace process. That's why I send you letters. That's why I want to talk this through, because all in all, this is going this way. And you can be on. I didn't say you can be on the train or not, because you know it wouldn't have made any sense out there. But you know, essentially, you know, the train's leaving. Do you want to, do you want to get on or not? As the case may be. And I talked them through. I talked him through what we we're doing, what we'd done with the other village. You know. And whenever I spoke to them out there, um, I was always speaking to the men. But a lot of the messages that I was using were actually over the men to the women behind them. So talking about, so I mean, actually, you know, how, how are you eating at the moment? Are you getting everything you need? Um, I've seen some of the children here. They've got pink eye. We can bring the doctors in. We can do this. Knowing that once we'd left, they'd then be getting it in the ear from their women folks saying, yeah, we're really quite sick and tired of actually living in the jungle, you know, not having, you know, the things that we need to, 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 to get on with life. Mm. Um, so that, that had worked, you know, a couple of times. And, you know, there's one time when with one of the other villages, I said, look, we're going to come and do this. I don't want anybody else shooting at us because they decided to mortar us and shoot us as we we're coming in or shoot at us. Um, which they thought was incredibly funny. And I said, look, I don't want any more of that happening, you know, and listen, guys, if that does happen, my mother is going to come here from England and she's going to be really angry with you. Of course, the boys, you know, the, the guys just, you know, okay, fine. But the women behind just started laughing, you know, yeah, he's, he's threatened them with his mother, you know. So, that, you know, and that, again, going on to what I did after I left the military, when you're talking about sort of key messages yeah. and your audiences, you know, getting it right there, for all of the stakeholders, I think is very, very important. Mm. Yeah, that, let's uh, transition a little bit because you, you mentioned some some of these lessons, but you then transitioned into the world of crisis and risk consulting. And yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, did this experience inform your thinking around that? Or did it, 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 did, it did to agree once everything fell into place. Um, I, when I left, uh, there's a very good organization that helps um, servicemen leaving called the Office Association. So I went and had an interview with them. I'd really enjoyed my time with the UN. And so I basically said, you know, really like the idea of working for or with the UN, etc. Which was interesting because then I started getting sort of, you know, well, we need a, we need some uh, logistics drivers out in Sarajevo. We know, probably not quite what I was looking for. But I was very fortunate. My father-in-law introduced me to an individual who had been a senior government information officer, uh, civil servant. And he and I talked and he said, look, you really ought to think about 
public relations. Mm. So I went to the school of London School of Public Relations, and there was one thing which really fired me up there, and that was crisis communications. Uh, and I really saw um, a, a correlation um, between what I had done in various jobs within the military, but also looking at wider crisis management. Uh, that type of thing, because often in the military, you're trying to do something, you don't have all the stuff you need for it. So you've got to think through how you're going to do it against a very fluid situation as well. Things will change. So you need to be able to look at the contingencies for that change if that happens. There's the often misquoting, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Well, that's actually a mis, mis, that's, that's a misrepresentation of what the initial I think 12 sentences said, which is actually that you're, you do need to plan. You do need to plan to get you through the skirmishing parties so that you can then engage with the main body of the enemy. And that's when your plan may well fall back. Right. So you need to plan to get there. Yeah. Um, and so having seen what I'd done in the military, seeing crisis community and seeing crisis management, having had this chat with the friend of uh, my father-in-law, I then said, right, okay, it is public relations for me and it's crisis communications. So I did some freelance work for things, but also it allowed me to put a more informed wish list into the office association. A little bit like a computer, rubbish in, rubbish out, you know, and I'd given it initial rubbish. And so not, it wasn't rubbish at all, but you know, it wasn't suitable for me it was coming out. And now that I knew what I wanted to do, the whole thing changed. So a number of companies were looking for people, one of whom was a company called Control Risks. I interviewed with about three or four of them, uh, but Control Risks you know, called me up within about half an hour, I think. Uh, said, are you still in Pimlico? Can you come back down to Victoria Street? I said, yeah, of course I can. And we started from there, really. So that was back in 1994. And I think since then, I've been working in crisis management and I did uh, went back to public relations as well with Burson Marstella uh, on their crisis and issues management team here in London as well. So, Crisis management, crisis communications, and, you know, through that, looking at risk management as well. And basically, I've been doing that now since, what, 25 plus years now. Um, and it's been great. It's been yeah. excellent. It's a fascinating field as well. Yeah. Could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the work that you did do? Because I, we know each other from Control Risks, uh, and there's a movie made out of, <laughs> based on the firm. Uh, and it sounds possibly in, you know super interesting and, and glamorous and, and and so on but you also mentioned that trying to rescue hostages for instance in a, in a situation can backfire you've seen that sort of thing yeah anything that sort of strikes you as memorable from your work as a crisis management I guess acute kidnapping secure acute security crises that that sticks out and maybe some one or two lessons that you took from from those. yes. I mean, I think obviously client confidentiality will will impact everything that we, we we talk through now. But I mean, I think one of the one of the things about it is that yes, the film Proof of Life uh, did a great deal uh, to glamorise what we do as uh, commercial crisis response consultants. But I think the most important thing to understand about it is that somewhere now in the world there is a family and potentially an employer who are looking at an abyss because one of their employees and for the family one of their loved ones has been taken hostage kidnapped or in a hostage situation in a, in a hotel through a terrorist attack or something. And that'll, that's happening now. That has happened to some family now. And it is the fact that you're looking at an abyss. You know, you don't go to business school and do five weeks on how to get your kidnapped employees back. You don't wake up on a sunny day in 32 Acacia Avenue in Leeds and say, oh, tell you what, get the family around and what we'll do is we'll talk through how we get someone back if they've been yeah. kidnapped. And it is that ability to go in and reassure, but reassure realistically. Mm. And by that, I mean, is my wife in danger? Is my husband in danger? Is my partner going to die? Right. You've got to realize that your loved one, partner, whoever it is, 
is in a dangerous situation and people sometimes do not come back. So there's got to be mm. then the reassurance. But in the work that I've done with families, in the work that I've done with, com uh, with companies, the work that my team does with companies, more often than not, 98, 99% mm. of our taken, of those taken in the cases that we advise you on will come back alive. And I think it's that ability then to go in and give them realistic reassurance, but then also get rid of that abyss, that black hole that they're mm. staring at, and actually give them the route map mm. of how this is going to go. But also from our experience gained from debriefing other uh, victims, you would say, right, and this is what's probably going through the kidnappers' minds at the moment. This is what they're probably doing at the moment. This is what's probably going through your loved ones' minds. So it now it, you add some color. You, they can now start to visualize what is taking place mm. and that again doesn't necessarily give them comfort but it gives them some reassurance so it's that ability to objectively mm. without emotion talk to them against a tried and tested methodology but not templated because you can't template these things because yes the ingredients may well be the same mm. but there's going to be something there which is slightly different. And if you miss that, or if you don't take that into account, it could be fatal. Mm. And when I talk to, on the training aspects of it, when I talk to people about the ingredients, mm. you know, I can get, I can, I can get some uh, flour, I can get some milk, I can get some oil, I can get some butter, onions, minced meat, and I can get some, uh, I can get some onions, uh, sorry, tomatoes. What can I do with that? Uh, some a shepherd's pie or a cottage well, pie or something like spaghetti. that. Spaghetti. Yeah, spaghetti. Okay. So I can do spaghetti. Yeah. I can do with a with a ragu sauce. Hmm. I could do cannelloni. I could do so it's actually different dishes, but the same ingredients because hmm. I've used them in different ways. Hmm. And that's what I when I talk to companies, you know, training yeah, the ingredients in the same are the same. Yes, someone's been taken, we've got some kidnappers, we've got a demand. So all the ingredients are there. Yeah. But let's not Say we're going to make spaghetti because we're not going to make spaghetti with this one. This is probably going to be the cannelloni because there's another factor in there. Someone's thrown some uh, balsamic vinegar in there or something. You know, so we've got another ingredient. Yeah. So that's why you can't template your approach to these things. Right. I think that's a very important lesson for lots of people in that might be listening to this that that work in the professional services space or that hire people that are advisors of all kinds. Because I think that's what a true expert is able to to do is to take the understand the difference between the ingredients and the the actual yeah, yeah. actual dish. I I did want to maybe spend a, just a little looking at that abyss, right? So yeah, that yeah. is uh, in any situation of crisis, uncertainty. To me, that's a dangerous place to be because that's when you you can react on emotion and make a mistake and make it worse. Correct. No, no, absolutely correct, Ben. And it, it, it is that point. Yeah, so there is the abyss. We've got two reactions to that. Well, there are any number of reactions to that, but there are two really quite dangerous ones. One is the freeze. Mm. Oh, I don't know what we're going to do. Mm. The other one is the, right, I'm going to take charge and I'm going to get really stuck into this. Mm. And you actually jump off the cliff because you don't know what you're doing. The, how do you overcome that? Essentially, you've got, to be aware of what the risks to your entity might be or to your processes. You know, what is out there? What could possibly go wrong? From the risk management side, then, so can we get rid of those risks? So I'm going to be sending a team of auditors out to Columbia. Well, it's a bit unfair on Columbia because of the situation, well, it's, it's not very good at the moment, but it has improved seriously since you and I knew each other in controlled risk. But, so I'm sending them out to somewhere where kidnapping is an issue. Uh, so what can I do then? So I can get them picked up at the airport uh, by sensible people. I can make sure the hotel's fine. I make sure I brief them before they go mm -hmm. so that they know the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. um, and then make sure that the people they're going to see are the right type of people. Due diligence on those people. Are we sending them to the right people? Yes, we are. And this, that, and the other. And then maintain callback logs. You know, okay, fine. Let's have a chat every day. Make sure everybody's safe and sound. And this, that, and the other. So you could, so I can manage that risk. But if you come to something which you can't, then what can we do about it? Well, let's make sure we've got plans to manage the impact of that risk if it takes place. Sure. 
So if we've got a plan, what is that plan doing? Mm. Is it shelfware? Mm. Yeah, we've got a plan. Yeah, it was done 10 years ago. Okay, oh, they're not on the team anymore. They're not on the team anymore. Oh, that changes. That number's changed. In fact, we made an acquisition. In fact, actually, that's not a company anymore because we've been merged. Mm. Okay, so that plan has got to be dynamic, but also that plan has got to be known by the teams mm. that are going to actually use it and mm. implement it. I went out to do a case in Venezuela a long time ago. And I arrived and walked in to see the corporate crisis management team. And I said, hi, guys. Good. I said, you know, before I left London, I was briefed that you guys had a crisis management plan. And I said, yes, we do. And I said, well, where is it? I said, well, it's holding the door open at the moment because the air conditioning's broken. All right. And it was a huge lever arch file. Useless. Sorry, wrong. No, it's not useless. But as a manual of how to get your team together get them to engage their brains and get them through the first two or three hours, mm. not good. Mm. If you distill that down mm. to a three-page brief mm. plus the contact list, you're done. You're good to go. And you can put that on a phone. You can put, you, mm. you, know, what, you, you can have it anywhere. That's what you need to do. And then so you need to then train and rehearse the team mm. so they don't have that rabbit caught in the headlights moment. Yeah. But also... Terry over there, who's always a bit of a bull in a china shop, doesn't go running off the cliff mm. and doing the wrong thing. Mm. I know I've called the police. Why did you call the police? Mm. We don't know what's happened yet. Mm. And suddenly you may well find actually you're operating in a jurisdiction where the police are actually the kidnappers. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, someone's taken our employee. Yeah, we know. What do you mean you know? Mm. <laughs> anyway, so that's what you've got to do. And then a little bit like everybody does a fire drill. We know what to do, and we've got our fire wardens, and they've got their nice. Good, and we do it every year, we do it twice a year, <clears throat> and it always goes well because those you know the fire is going to probably have a long lunch, mm. uh, and the others just go out and do what they're supposed to do. Mm. So, how often do you actually exercise your team, your crisis management team? Because again, that is the thing that's going to get you over that moment when Murphy's law always dictates 11.30 on a Friday night or 2.30 on a Sunday morning. That's when the call comes in. The Friday night one is explained by the fact that the subsidiary is now bored of dealing with it because they've been dealing with it all week. Oh, let's pass it upstairs. Mm. So that's why it gets to court. Well, why didn't you tell us about this before? Well, we thought we could manage it, but we can't. Um, again, that's unfair, but it sometimes happens. Mm. Mm. Um, but so the thing is that you have that moment, and of course, you get that call at 11.30 of a Friday night or 2.30 on a Sunday morning, and you are the COO of a big organisation, and you're informed that Duncan uh, Smith has been taken uh, somewhere, et cetera, et cetera, and you're going, oh, I really didn't want to get that call. Mm. But, oh, I remember that training that we got with Mark Harris. Okay, fine. What I need to do now is convene the crisis management team, Let's do it on that conference call number that we set up. Let's get everybody on, brief them up, uh, stand them to, uh, Eric, you know, yeah, you've got to contact those, you've got to contact the insurers, you've got to do this, you know. Right, let's get this game going. And uh, and uh, you and I are going to drive and go and see the family up in Leeds and uh, speak to them about it. Mm-hmm. So you're cutting down that 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 moment of paralysis. The other thing about cutting that down, perhaps not necessarily with a kidnap, always like more seek not secret but sort of hidden crises mm. <clears throat> with a public crisis um and now with social media mm. you know sometimes head offices are learning about something from a tweet yeah. rather than learning about it from the subsidiary yeah. you know wow wait, that looks like our factory what's that smoke doing coming out the top mm. of it we haven't been told yet so you need again to cut down that reaction time mm. there because if you don't enter that space, demonstrate that you are responding responsibly mm. and robustly and that you are communicating with stakeholders and indeed perhaps even to the media, may well, but to the media it may well be, listen, something has gone wrong. Mm. We're finding out what's gone wrong and we're going to rectify mm. it more later. Mm. Now leave us alone. Um, oh, that's the implied message. Because if you don't do that, someone else is going to step in. Mm. Next thing you know, there's a press conference being led by the fire chief. Well, well, I think that's quite disgusting. There are dangerous chemicals there, and you know, I don't know. Well, I don't want you saying that because yeah. that's actually not the case. But mm. that's what you think. So, 
someone's going to fill that space for you if you don't step up to the plate, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And again, that's why you've got to go through this system of what are the risks? Can we manage them out of there? Can we mitigate them, transfer them to insurance? Or if they're still outstanding, we're going to have to deal with it, take it on the chin. Have we got the plan? We've got people who can implement the plan. And do they know what they're doing? Mm. And if we can tick all those boxes, yeah. then we're halfway there. I think there, well, there's a lot of really good stuff there. I think for a lot of individuals as well as organizations, there's a reluctance to engage in this type of thinking and planning because one, oh, I don't, it's a very remote possible event that very unlikely. And we don't want to go there. One is maybe waste resources, but secondly, just don't want to think about it. <laughs> and just yeah. wondering how would an organization, how ought to an organization think about that? Or how do you work with leaders to say, hey, you know, guys, at some point, something's going to go wrong. You better be ready. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's a, that, it is a very valid point. And I think many, many years ago, I think there was a quote in the Financial Times, you know, the, the, the one time not to, you know, start plan, you know, your crisis management plan is when you're in a crisis yeah. or something along those, those lines. And also, you know, there is this reluctance to engage in the preparation pre-incident for something which may never happen. Mm. That's all jolly good until it does happen. Mm. Uh, I remember uh, before 9-11 took place, speaking to companies and saying, look, can we have a crisis management uh, exercise, please, Mark? Yes, of course you can. And don't, whatever you do, like the last clown did, and have some airplane crashing into a head office because it's not going to happen. Okay. Well, which, you know, I understood at the time. And I think now, with what has has gone on, with with covid etc i think there is a, a real need for those doubting thomases to revisit their position of doubt mm. or their reasons for doubting because if you go through the system if you go through the sort of the program of preparation training rehearsal uh, and then being ready it helps. So if you're looking at something really acute, it really helps with the day-to-day stuff as well. Oh, we've just had a truck mm. back into the warehouse. They've taken out the gate and mm. oh, fortunately they've knocked someone over. And Rather than running around like headless chickens, we know what we're going to be doing. Why? Because we've, we've trained hard. Yeah. And now we can fight easy mm. or respond easy. And I think that's very important. But, what, how do we try to persuade people when they're not really, well what you look at their industry you look at what they're doing uh you then look at perhaps the regions where they're operating mm. what you then do is you get a few pertinent incidents that may well have happened to their competitors mm-hmm. may well have happened to in the country they're, they're in say so, right okay fine you're doing this mm. here here and here don't forget what happened here with those communal riots and then those three workers got ripped apart mm. now what I want you to do is wake up tomorrow, look in the mirror, look at your family at breakfast, and say, oh, do we really want to respond saying, we didn't know that would happen? Mm. Is that what you'd like to happen to you and your family? No. Right, let's sort it out. Mm. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Mm. And the old lovely phrase, um, you know, an ounce of prevention against a pound of cure. Mm. And if you look at some of the major FTSE 100 companies that with monotonous regularity are making some mess up, mm. either with a crisis or with an issue, yeah. you know, you think, how, why? The mm. same happened to you five years ago. Mm. And the other thing about it from a communications point of view and the, and the media is it makes the journalist's job a lot easier because mm. all I have to do now is I have to do three or four centimetres of what's actually taking place. Then I've got loads, mm. loads of history on this because this happened then, this happened then, this happened then. And then how are you going to look potentially in a court of law? Mm. When you get sued for this, well, this has happened before and you didn't manage it then, so we're going to punish you more. In the court of um, public opinion, mm. I'm not going to buy their products anymore because they keep on messing up. Mm. 
and also in the court of investment shareholders. Mm-hmm. Do I really want to invest in that company? Financial institutions. Do I really want to invest in that company? Mm-hmm. Can't see, they can't seem to manage their way out of a paper bag. Mm-hmm. Never mind a crisis. Yeah, I think those are all valid, very valid arguments. And also, as you were talking, I was just thinking that just working on your individual or collective crisis management muscles is good, right? So we often, and I often in the past, I've heard, you know, we need a crisis management plan for pandemic and also for 15 kinds of flu. There are also, so you can't predict every single event. The event is going to unfold of its own volition, but the act of actually thinking about what's going on and what to do about it is incredibly powerful. Yeah, and I think that very much uh, when I came into uh, the profession in uh, middle the middle nineties, that very much was the way of crisis management planning. Mm-hmm. So you'd have your overall generic crisis management. Um, this is a crisis management team. This is who should be on it. This is an incident management team. This is who should be on it. These are sort of agendas that you need. This, that, and the other. Great. Okay, fine, good. Uh, and then because of who you are. You've then got annexes A through Z mm-hmm. of if you know that happens, this is your plan. If that happens, this is your plan. Now, what is unfortunate, and more so now, due to the interconnectivity of everything, and indeed Mark Galliotti's book, The Weaponization of Everything, mm-hmm. is also connected now that people will become paralyzed, but, oh, it's not a, it's not Annex J, but it's not... Yeah. It, it, well, it's a little bit of Annex J, and, oh, and there's a K. Yeah. Oh, and some of the M, too. Oh, what do we do? Oh, I don't know. Mm. So simplify it down. So business working, business working, business stops. Mm-hmm. Why is it stopped? Mm-hmm. Now, have we practiced something about that? It's stopped because the country manager has been taken. Okay, fine. Well, we can kickstart the business again. Mm-hmm. We don't need the country manager. Well, not at the moment we don't. But then we've got some specialists going to come in and deal with that. But the rest of it is now business continuity. Uh, it's resilient. So let's let's get that fired up and, and keep going, etc. So don't plan for it. Identify every event, yes, because you need that for your risk uh, register and your risk management to see if you can get it out and get rid of it, transfer it, or then have to face up to it. But then don't plan for every eventuality because you will get stuck on it. Mm-hmm. And... My experience of 25 plus years Mm -hmm. in advising uh, companies and indeed families on how to respond to an issue or a crisis is that no one issue or crisis is the same. Yes, there are bits and pieces which you've seen before. And yes, you can have playbooks on how you're going to react and you can have pre-prepared statements, but, you know, and signed off by general counsel, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, you need flexibility and you need the right minds around that table to be agile and then to make the decision and then sign off Mm -hmm. and implement it. And one thing that I've always been curious about is that when a crisis hits, some people freeze, right? The people that are meant to be maybe the leaders in an organization or somewhere and they kind of, maybe they shrink and then maybe others step up and, and it's just strange who plays what role. It's hard sometimes to predict that. And I'm just wondering if you have any insights on on that. Is it those people who who step up? Are they just they just have got a bit of that training, or what, the people that freeze are that don't have it? What's the? Is there some? I I think the important thing about leadership is that you can have leadership at every single level of your organisation. It's not the. It's not the. It's not the CEO is the leader. It may well be Tony on the shop floor who suddenly sees something go awry. He steps up to the plate because he knows mm-hmm. in his mind that this is the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Now, not everybody is going to be able to do that it does, because not everybody's a leader. Mm-hmm. We just got to accept that. But by going through the training, and, and when I talk about you know planning to clients now and, and, and getting your crisis management system up and running, one of your proof tests is take it down to Tony on the shop floor and say, right, if this mm. happened and we're going to do this, this is how we're looking to respond, is that going to work? Mm. No, that'll never work. And that's you know that's sort of proving proving the plan. Okay, 
Tony, so what do you suggest? Then? Well, if you did this, that and the other, you know, yeah, that would work. OK, great, thanks. So <clears throat> then you're also getting Tony's buy-in as well and they'll know what to do. So it is, it is getting the overall, it's inculcating a culture of issue and crisis response. Not everybody goes through the training. You can't do that. You can't afford it. I mean, obviously, I'd love to be able to do that because it'd be great for invoicing, but you're not going to do it. It's not, it's not, it's not, not cost effective. But through education, through town hall meetings, through policy directors, which come down to the nose board, that will mean that Erica or Tony, when they come to lock up on a Friday night, and I said, oh, is that a little bit of smoke coming out of the office? Oh, I'll see what it's like on Monday. They actually know what to do then. They know where that safe pair of hands is to actually deliver that message. There's something wrong here. We need to act on it. Mm-hmm. So you will never get people who are going to freeze. Not necessarily not freezing. They will still freeze a bit, but you can mm-hmm. get them into action a bit quicker by running them through this. So they become more familiar with it. An interesting. There was an interesting um, moment when... Uh, I was uh, with a Scandinavian uh, company and we were going through a crisis management exercise with them, des- desktop. Now, I've, I've, I've never uh, favoured total harem scarum desktop mm. exercises because two things will happen. Either people will become very, very frightened and not know what to do, or executives just fold their arms, start, you know, in those days it used to be blackberries, but now, you know, they just get onto their handheld devices. And, and actually, not my exercise, fortunately, it was a company's exercise done by their own people, but we were asked to be observers. Three of them actually just walked out, so this is never going to happen, and just walked out. So that didn't go down very well. As I said, fortunately, we were not the authors or the, the uh, facilitators on that. We were just there as observers. Mm. But we, so we were going through a kidnap situation, and actually two members of the corporate crisis management team who were head sheds of their departments put their hand out and said, we can't do it. I I can't do this. Mm. This is, this, this really is too much for me. Mm. Far better. We knew at nine 30 on a sunny morning in Gothenburg or wherever it was, Mm. than discovering at 11 30 on a Friday night where we were looking to the team to come up with ideas, not ideas, but decision-making. So as I said, you've got to run through it from that point of view so that people become less afraid. They become more familiar with it. They understand it better and become more comfortable with mm. what is going to be asked of them. Yeah. Does that go some way? To sort of- yeah, I think, I think so. I think what you're also saying is it, it is a trainable skill. You, get, you can get better at it by, by putting yourself in these simulated situations yeah. and then thinking through not so much the step-by-step, you know, turn-by-turn instruction, but what are the decisions I've got to make? What information do yeah. I need to have? Where Where is it? Yes. Those, those kinds of things. No, no, it, it is that. And I think, you know, again, going back to my military career, there are going to be very few human beings who want to run towards mm. someone who is shooting at you. Mm-hmm. But what we do in the military is we will train people as individuals, as small units, sections, then as platoons, then as companies, then as battalions. So everybody knows what everybody else is bringing to the party. Everybody knows that they can depend on the person left and right of them, et cetera, et cetera, which then gives them that strength Mm. to overcome that instinct to run away, to actually run to. Yeah. police and, and, and others as well and there are other people outside of the emergency service and outside the military who will do it too but you know that is that is them but again going back to the training etc if you go in too hard too harem scarum at the start you'll just fight them even more mm. so another example of that was i spent some time with another scandinavian client one of the things they said, look, can we have a crisis management exercise? Uh, we actually want to look at road traffic collisions. We want to look at a, at a, at a rape, and we want to look at you know, a rape with someone who's gone off auditing something somewhere mm. and then gets raped. And uh, another one, but please no kidnap for ransom because we don't think we're operating. I said, I agree, Elena, you are operating areas. We're going to need that. What I had noticed, though, this company had um, recently been awarded Dow Jones. They'd been put on the Dow Jones Sustainability mm. in, uh, Index, and they were a timber and paper company i hope i haven't given away too much for the client confidentiality but the timber and paper company but 
that whole website was full of the fact, you know, we got Dow Jones, mm. sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. So my last sort of scenario for them, this crisis management work, day, day workshop we were doing for them, was that a chap called you know, Tor Jorgensen uh, from the Aftenblad had called up uh, saying that he was working on a story which was going to be published uh, the following day uh, that you as a company are bribing Russian forestry officials in the Karelian forests and actually taking more silver birds than you should be. Silence in the room. Now, I don't know if that silence in the room was because I'd actually got close to a nerve or something <laughs> that, that, that had happened before, you know. Sure. Oh, yeah. Damn, how did you know about that? But eventually I turned around to the CEO, who's a, who's a very nice chap, and I said, come on, Anders, you know, um, what are you going to do about this? Mm. And he looked at me and said, well, Mark, there's one thing we've learned. And I said, what's that? When you're standing in shit, you don't jump about. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that, was, that was a good one. So I said, you know, but going back to the whole thing of the crisis management, yes, I started off in at the more acute end of the spectrum with kidnaps and, uh, and things like that. But then there was the hostage taking and hijack of vessels off the Somali coast and, and, and those sort of things which were coming slightly more. But also having been at that end and also having worked at Bursa Marcel with crisis communications, become aware of a l more wider spectrum of issues and, 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 and which could then, if managed incorrectly, become a crisis. So, you know, a mine has problems with its local communities. You know, the mining engineers, they're not hardwired for the softer issues of community liaison, et cetera, et cetera. But they've got teams who do it. But do those, do those teams, do the engineers understand what the teams are trying to do? Do those teams feed back? So, you know, a whole load of palm trees are felled around your site. You can't move your vehicles. You're now losing $100,000, $500,000 a day because you can't move the ore. All for the sake of actually hiring another member of the community uh, liaison team to actually find out what the villagers are doing and then feed into the operators. Yeah. Now, you said you were going to be blowing, you're going to be detonating seven times to get this amount of rock. We're now on the 12th detonation. You've got more trucks coming through with rock. So, you know, when's it going to end? Mm. Why haven't you briefed us on this? Having been at the hard end, then you can bring all of that, the methodology back and look at something and as an individual I and mean, it drives my family nuts you know we're going off to see friends down in the west country here in the united kingdom we live in kent they live in dorset i get asked what time should we leave and i look at it i think about the m3 i think about the m25 m3 a303 oh dear mm. I, you know i think we should leave now mm. but we don't have to be there until tea time well we'll leave it too okay so tea time comes where are we we're still on the road mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> do you think that some organizations are deliberately crisis prone. And I say that because sometimes there are those who get lots of credit for solving a problem that they probably had, you know, possibly had some doing in terms of getting the organization into. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there was, uh, if, if you've come across that and, and if so, what do you do about that? I'm not going to name any companies because of, because of liable and things like that. But no, there are companies out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you look at companies that are working in the oil and gas area, you're looking in the extractive, et cetera, it is dangerous work from the get-go. Yeah. And they will do their best to make sure they are, from a health safety point of view, they are doing their bit to make sure everything goes. But sadly, a helicopter trying to come into a rig in the North Sea may well have a malfunction and it goes down. Now, it is, it is how you respond to that which, is, which will save you as an entity to a degree. And there are companies out there in that industry, whether it is the turnover of executives or an arrogance on their behalf, they just do not learn their lessons. Mm. And, you know, that is really quite frustrating. And I remember speaking to some of these companies, you meet them at a sort of a conference or a, and you say, oh, hi there, guys, how's it doing? Do you fancy a crisis manager? We don't need a crisis manager next to us from you. You know, we're, we're, we're good to go. Mm, okay, let's wait for your next one then. Mm -hmm. Oh, that didn't go down too well, did it? Mm -hmm. um, but there is an arrogance there, I think, sometimes. Mm. 
And it really does take them right up to the edge of their own confidence uh, zone before they'll call in help. And that often is way too late, Mm. way too late. And then it's almost they're calling consultants in to try and widen the blame frame. Right. It's going to look a lot better when you are in a uh, court of law facing a lawsuit for something health and safety wise or this or not. If you can actually demonstrate by mitigation that actually, yes, we're aware of the risk. We did this to try and manage that risk down. And more importantly, here are our plans that we exercised regularly. And here are the consultants who are going to come in and speak on our behalf and say, yes, they did those, they did those exercises. Mm-hmm. And also the court of public uh, perception of public opinion as well. Mm. And do you think that there are some changes in the types of things that organizations get themselves into i'm not sure i'm not sure it's a change of type Mm -hmm. but it's a change of how can i put this it's almost a change of environment as in environment the surrounding area yeah and some of those actors in it yeah so if i'm acme petroleum down in Nigeria in the 80s and the 90s, things could happen down there yeah. which I could manage in a timely fashion and in a relatively regimented, for one of a, you know, through uh, lines of uh, communicate, mm-hmm. communicate, lines of uh, management, etc., mm-hmm. etc., you know, and, and, and sort it out. Social media mm-hmm. and mobile phones have blown that wide open yeah. now. So it may well be that I'm Acme Petroleum and I'm still down in Nigeria and Andrew Smith is taken by one of the groups down there. He's taken, he's been kidnapped. Now at head office, wherever that is, might not know about that Mm. for an hour or two hours. But Andy's mate, Bill, wasn't taken bill knows andy's wife morag who lives up in aberdeen and gets on the phone to her mm. morag she, you should know and he's been taken Twitter so she's now calling the head office yeah, right okay what are you doing about my andy yeah. he's been taken yeah. what what do you mean yeah. how what yeah. or you know if we look at um um or she and then she goes on facebook or yeah know, something even, or yeah. the companies you know she's tells the Daily Mail about it because yeah. you think that's going to help. Yeah. And she wants her 15 minutes of fame, even if it's on the back of Andy being taken. Um, so so all of that, I think, is, is a real issue uh, now. So as I said, so so crisis management or, or the type of issues or issues and crises that it might face have not necessarily changed. It is that surrounding environment that has changed mm-hmm. And again, actually, for me, adds weight to the fact that you need to have your act together, mm. even if you don't think that thing is going to happen. Because when it does, mm. it's probably going to be played out in social media mm. before you know you even got your act together. You know, <laughs> don't be stupid. No one's going to land a plane on the Hudson River. That was filmed and up on social media yeah. straight away. No one's going to go wild um, at our uh, meeting today in London. Suddenly, someone comes in and it goes wild again. Social media, and it's all there. So that's that is one of the reasons why you need to do that. I think the other thing about it as well is that with the um, uh, advances in in legislation with regards to health and safety and um, other other sort of stuff like that. Again, the court of law now is starting to kick in more on it. And if you are if you are not able to demonstrate that you one had identified the risks, two had a plan to uh, manage them or to, to respond to them, and people to do that and they did the job well, then you're going to be hung out to dry. Yeah. And also, you're not going to be able to recruit the creme de la creme that you want to recruit. Are you going to work for a company that lurches from crisis to crisis? Mm. No. Hmm. you're going to work for one of their competitors who doesn't mm-hmm. yeah in the the news very recently was the uh, I don't know if you've come across the what Twitter's actually been dealing with in terms of uh, a testimony about um, 
their uh, data security and um, it strikes me that so they've got this whistleblower who sort of said that you know he he warned the leadership at, at Twitter many times about how insecure their their data is and now it's you know it's obviously it's all over the the news um, and I'm kind of thinking you've got new you you've got so the composition of the FTSE the Dow Jones you've got tech companies here and you've got leaders who may not have they're not kind of battle hardened if you like and do you think that it takes a few hard knocks for for, for you talk about those that don't seem to learn but is is that do many learn through the school of hard knocks and is it just a question of you know the likes of a a twitter just just trying to get a, get away with whatever they can get away with on the on the data side not thinking about the stuff what we what what do you think is going on with i think the the interesting is is that there are always going to be founders of companies who are visionaries mm. and they see they might not see themselves that but we look at them and think oh, okay fine you know and you think about people like um steve jobs and others you know how engaging they were, what communicators were, etc., and selling an idea and and, and, and giving the idea, etc. You know, there will be people like that, and you could probably sit down with them and you can talk to them until you're blue in the face about the fact. Well, actually, well, hold on. What happens is, is that they don't want to be bound by that because that's not yeah. the vision. That's not the way it's going. Yeah. Okay, fine, great. Mm. Let's not try and you know harness that individual with the the strappings of crisis management mm-hmm. etc now who else within the board actually is aware of this mm-hmm. get buy-in from them yeah or non-execs they're very you know yeah. not sorry you are non-exec director do you want to be in court about this mm-hmm. uh, no i don't right well this is what we need to do to get a group of it so it's then getting their buy-in them to champion it leave the visionary doing what they're doing mm-hmm. they're great at it and then you can start building your crisis management, your approach to issues mm-hmm. of crisis management around that lot. And just, you know, hey, what were you doing last week? You know, we just did an exercise. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it, Bill. Don't worry about it, mm-hmm. Steve. Don't worry about it, Elon. You know, we're fine. Mm-hmm. We're good to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then be ready with the big fire net to catch them when they, uh, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> when they is, mess up. This is the thing that, that uh, some of the fines that get levied for some of these types of things are really just, they just amount to a, a, a fee, a license fee to, to do things that yes. are, are kind of untoward and dangerous. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think probably from that point of view, I think that, you know, somewhere or other there needs to be a look at actually what sort of punishments are given yeah. out. And certainly when yeah. it comes down to corporate uh, manslaughter here, you know, people will go to jail. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if it can be proven that you, as the chief finance officer, did mm. not sign off on that budget because there wasn't any money there, mm. and this person died because that budget had not been signed off, you right. could go to jail. Mm. And I think, you know, whilst we can use the carrot, you know, yes, mm. if you've got good crisis management systems in place, you'll be able to respond quicker, which means less downtime, yeah. and you look better from a reputation point of view. Blah blah blah. Great. Those are the carrots, and stick it. And yeah. if you don't, you could go to jail. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that, and I think there are we're still coming to grips with the societal impacts of some of these, you know, some of these firms, and and that's a it's very similar to the the debate around debates around climate change and pollution, and you know the the kind of societal cost of of some of these things. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm also curious about your thoughts around how transferable some of these crisis management skills are to individuals and our sort of maybe personal crises or individual crises, uh, what you, you know, what you might do in, you know, the event of something difficult happening and how you might, I know we don't like to think about this stuff, but there are, there's value to thinking about some scenarios and what you would do in the event of. And yeah. I was wondering. I think it, I think it's very important. I think, where I think this probably comes from, actually, and, and you and I have chatted about this on the phone before, and I think one of the things for me in 25 plus years is was COVID. Mm-hmm. And I think COVID, the, the, where COVID, I think, really 
you know, set the sort of not necessarily the new frame for crisis management, but certainly really did sort of um, impact it is that if you have an employee kidnapped, you have an employee kidnapped, and you've got five people in the company who probably more know about it, but five people know about the response, they know how they're doing it, you've got some pretty special consultants in helping you, you may well be working with law enforcement and governments, etc. But it's all confidential very very quiet and also as you know uh, jeremy smith at the end of that day i can park that problem there mm. and i can go home get myself a gin and tonic mm. chat with my family etc but the problem has not come with me if we look at hijacking a vessel, slightly more open, but still, you know, there is a finite time. So a kidnap might be a week, two weeks, three weeks, but it's done. Hijacking of a vessel towards the end, you know, sort of 2011, etc., could be up to about 11 months, but it would be done at the end of that. But again, with those, you could go back home. And yes, of course, you'd think about it, but, you know, you could think, all right, fine. With COVID, you were potentially working from home yeah. so different environment then perhaps internet wasn't quite up to speed as it would be at work but you know we can work through that but still you know a little bit of stress and concern yeah. about that uh, and actually have it got it right with all of our firewalls and always someone going to sneak in uh but then probably you know you're going to be managing issues because actually shanghai is closed down so we can't get what we wanted from there and oh they're not producing at the moment. So what is my supply chain going to be? Doing? What's my distribution chain going to be doing, etc. So you're, you're, you're being challenged by business continuity issues thrown up by COVID. And then Wendy comes in from HR and says, well, so-and-so has now done this, that, and the other. Oh, I've got to deal with that. Then you, know, you go home if you've been working in the office or you're working mm. from home. But you then wander out of your study at home yeah. and you're then getting in the neck yeah. about the children yeah. not being good at homeschooling, this, that, and the other. And also, more importantly, Ocado didn't deliver the right type of avocados because apparently we've all got to make sort of, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, sacrifice. So it was all there. And also, okay, the consultant said this is going to be over in two weeks for a kidnap. <laughs> when is this going to be over? Yeah, exactly. Is it ever going to yeah. be over? Yeah. So I think from that point of view, and coming back to your question, it's a rather long way of answering your question. But from an individual's point of view, are there things that we can take from what people do for commercial crisis management? Yes, there are. And I think one of the most important things is the arrival at the objective of what you want. And it is this classic thing, and I forget who said it originally, but it's, you know, the best way to process your way through is to start at the end, start with the end state. Where do you want to be after all of this? So set your, what do you want? Okay, the children are acting up, this, that, and other. What do we want? We want to get back to peace and quiet. How are we going to achieve peace and quiet? Well, there may be that quick thing, which a lot of people do. I don't necessarily hold with. Okay, let's get my phone out and give them my phone. Uh, right. But what else can we do? Well, you can get, let's chat to the children. <laughs> let's say, what is the problem? This, that, and the other. Because that's where we want to get to. And these are things that we need to do to get there. So, yeah, it's that ability to look at the objective, establish what your objective is, mm -hmm. and then work towards it. Mm -hmm. Control those things that you can control and be agile in your response to those that you can't. Mm -hmm. I also think there's, with COVID, there's a, there's a fatigue. I, actually, I'm sure in uh, your work as well that leaders get tired no no you know that that with with covid you're working but then you know we had to also make all these calculations should we go to this thing or that thing especially if you uh, you've got people in your circle that are were you know are were immunocompromised yeah, yeah. You know, and it's just it's never ending yeah know? No, I think that that again I think is very very important I think from the point of view of occupational health experts uh men mental health i mean that is very very important and again i think that is something that is now more i see that being addressed more uh in crisis management again or not again so i see that being um 
looked at more, which is great. We've always talked about it. We've always said that, you know, one of the other things that you need to do as, you know, a consultant and also with some member of the crisis management team is check the crisis management team. Are they okay? Mm. Do, do they need rest? Do they need rotating out? Uh, because you can't afford to start having decisions made mm-hmm. uh, by a human engine that is only functioning at 40% because it may well be the wrong decision. And I think that's an important point that you make, because I also think in a lot of organizations, we make decisions, we do things, and we just kind of think that we're almost like robots. You just kind of think sort of from this sort of neck up kind of, a, yeah. kind of an approach that, but sleep matters, uh, nutrition matters, uh, just mental state, emotional state matters. And if we're not, taking care of those things then we can slip up yeah yeah no no it, it, it is very very important uh that, that 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 is looked after certainly certainly we've covered quite a lot of ground here i'm just wondering if there's anything that you wanted to mention that you don't think we've gotten a chance to dive into adequately i think i mean i think the again i, I did it on that recent blog of mine and that is and it comes back to what we've just been talking about and that is this you know is VUCA um, you know volatility uh, uncertainty complexity and ambiguity is VUCA originally out of the military when the wall came down and the Soviet Union packed up and went home or packed up (laughs) fell apart uh, and the Warsaw Park packed up and went home and then into the boardroom and business schools etc is it the preserve of the boardroom no it isn't and I think now, on the back of a supposedly oven-ready Brexit, which still had the giblets in it and the plastic wrapping, so it wasn't oven-ready, we then had COVID. So so Brexit, post-Brexit, was never practised in a real situation. It was in a COVID world where there were already uh, impacting factors. Mm. And then coming out of COVID and Putin invades mm-hmm. uh, Ukraine, so again, issues there. So it is it is an unrelenting major global issues stroke crises, which are impacting business. And then add to that, out of all of that, we start getting impacted at the personal level. I can't buy the crisps I want at the supermarket because they haven't arrived today because someone didn't have fuel to get them here today. I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. And actually, I can't afford it anymore because of the cost of living. Am I going to eat or am I going to heat? All of this now against an unrelenting, I think, you know, cycle of pretty bad news is now weighing heavily. So is VUCA boardroom only? No, it's not. It's at the personal level. There is that uh, vulnerability. There is that um, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. So, again, it goes back to what what is our objective? What are we going to do? We're going to get through the day. How are we going to get through the day? Well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do the other. Okay, fine. Can I manage that? Can I manage that? And if I do go to the supermarket and I can't get that, what is my flexible, agile response to that mm-hmm. rather than jumping up down and saying, why can't I get these? Yeah. Is, okay, fine. I can do it with this. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things we've uh, all, we kind of think about back to normal, right? Like, let's, you know, let, waiting for things to get back to normal. <laughs> we're finding out that there is no normal <laughs> no and i i you know the other thing which i think we should always strive for when it comes to successfully navigating uh, issue management and crisis management is that you emerge at a better level than you went into it mm-hmm. that you've learned from it you've perhaps implemented measures to make sure that one's not going to bite you uh and that the overall experience has improved and empowered your executive team, your management team, your supervisors, and indeed the workforce Mm. to manage the next one better. Mm. And perhaps, you know, slightly more comfortably Mm. from their own point of view. And, I think with, with, with what is happening at the moment, again, it is that, you know, right, fine. Well, you know, we had a really good day yesterday, 
Right, so what what went well yesterday, let's replicate that, let's make sure we remember we did that that way and this something else so we can then ensure that today is improved and, and we keep on going that way. Um but no, it's, I mean, it, it, it is tough. I think it's tough, tough for uh, organizations and companies, and, and it's tough for the individuals within those yeah. companies. Yeah, I think there's a lot there that's very valuable in terms of just kind of training the crisis management muscles. Yeah. And being comfortable in those situations where there is that abyss or just being able to look kind of beyond the, you know, the, the abyss that you, that you describe and it's, and it's useful. It may be not a pleasant thing to exercise, but it's a useful thing to, to do that provides some confidence and some. No, indeed. I mean, I, th- I think, I think it's very, very important. And, and, you know, as, as a consultant in, in, in this profession, I always love to be able to go off and, and facilitate workshops and, and exercises for people, but there isn't always the budget for it. But there, there's one simple thing. So if you have a champion of, of, of issues and crisis management in your organization, and if, the, if there is then a coordinator who sort of keeps people at it, et cetera, all it needs is essentially is, oh, by the way, did you see what happened to our competitor X, Y, Z? Yeah. Okay. That could possibly happen to us. So, look, this Friday, how are we doing this Friday? Well, we're fine. Okay, I'll go down to the sandwich shop. I'm going to get some sandwiches at lunchtime. Can we just come into this meeting room? Just sit down and say, right, this is the circumstances that affected X, Y, Z. Us as Acme widgets, we could have walked straight into that poo trap ourselves. How would we have stood up against that? Yeah. Bill, yeah, no, good to go. This no, actually, uh, Anne, yeah, no, fine. Uh, uh, Eric, well, actually, on the PR side, I think we need to look at this and look at some more of our uh, mm-hmm. prepared statements. Okay, great. There's an action. Now, have I paid Mark Harris zillions of dollars for that? No, but Mark Harris did mention it the last time he was with us. But that's one of the things you could do. Yeah. Uh, and then you can look up. And this, I, I talked to you about this thing that, that, that I've been working on with a business uh, mm-hmm. colleague, Crisis Fit whereby you've actually providing the thread from risk management into crisis management into crisis communication. So you can identify that thread which goes through all of them. So it's not siloed. So the risk register isn't done once a year, signed off. Have you seen it? Yes. Have the auditors seen it? Yes, they have. Oh, tick, 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 good, bang. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, it's continuously ongoing. And actually, yeah. the crisis communicators have sight of. Yeah. The crisis management people have sight of. Mm-hmm. And the risk managers have sight of what they're doing about it. And then might actually be able to go back to the risk register and say, actually, well, hold on, mm-hmm. they've got their act together. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one final thing, it, slightly it, just going back to the whole kidnap piece. And it's just something out of curiosity because I'm just thinking that some of my listeners, this is like an area that's completely, completely new. So resolving... And I, and I hope it stays yeah, that way. Yeah, I hope it stays them. that way for everybody. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, how does resolving a kidnap situation involve paying a ransom or a reduced rate is the idea that you negotiate a, you know, a a release and that makes it maybe not worthwhile economically if it's we're talking about a, a, you know, an economically motivated situation. Yeah. Um, well, how do these things typically, you know, how, what does a resolution often or typically, if there is such a thing, look like? I think that, you know, um, looking at my experience over, over the years, the majority of kidnaps in the world will be criminal and they will be financially motivated. Now, that financial motivation, I remember sitting down with a Mexican family who we don't, we can't understand why Jose was taken. Well, what about your profile financially? Well, we're, you know, we're middle class. Mm. Okay, well, let's just think about that. You've got this wonderful house here in Polanco in Mexico City. You've just told me you've got a holiday house in Acapulco, and actually you're thinking about going up to your ranch in Texas. You told me that you have a helicopter, and also that you have part share of a plane. Now, I describe myself from the UK as being middle class. I'd love to be middle class like that. So it's a perception. Now, but also at the other end of that, the fact that you are walking down a street, you have a briefcase, you have a tie. For someone on that street, you are 
Mm. Not wealthy, but you've got money. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go for you because I can get some money. So what we ideally don't want to do is to pay the whole demand as soon as we can, because that is basically going to fuel the crime. Mm. Secondly, it might not result in the release of the victim because they might think, if I've paid that much that quickly, if they've paid there's that more, much, more, we, 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 there. we've not asked for enough. Mm. Or, again, going back to Mexico, I mean, as you remember, I looked after Control Risk Mexico for a long time, or for, or for a while. But a lot of it is, is for experience from there. But another, again, another family who, who we didn't know until it came to their third kidnapping, but they're a relatively wealthy family in the South, Dino Petrogal, and um, their son was taken, eldest son taken, they paid the full ransom within 24 hours. Now, fortunately, the son was returned. Three weeks later, son number two is taken. Dad picks up the phone, and it's exactly the same kidnapper. Uh, he pled poverty. He said, no, no, don't plead poverty with me. Uh, but he said, okay, it's going to take time. So they paid about 80% within two days. Like that. We got to hear about it on the third kidnap when the daughter was taken, same kidnappers. And we managed to prevail upon him that actually go for a negotiated settlement. Make it difficult for them because then they won't come looking at you again. And another extreme case was the case of a five-month-old baby who was taken. And the family wanted to pay immediately and pay quickly. And we were really trying very hard. I it was totally understandable where they're coming from, but we were trying really hard mm. to get them to negotiate. And eventually, this sort of, it was very emotional. Um, and I turned around to them. I said, okay, fine. That's your five-month-old baby. That's your two-year-old son. Mm. Do you want him taken next week? I said, I don't want to go through this ever again. I said, right, well, if we, if, if we work together on this, baby will come home and you won't go through this again. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. But it was very, very difficult. And when I talk about us being objective yeah. and being unemotional, it was very difficult to be unemotional about that because I had my own children as well. Mm. And, you know, you think, oh, grief. Mm. Yeah. That's very, uh, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for this conversation. Before we go, though, if people want to learn more about the work that, you do or maybe get in touch with you or anything like that what, what are the best places to do so probably um yeah i, I do have a small consulting i'm a crisis consulting but i don't have a website or they probably sort of linkedin is is always good or also as i mentioned crisis fit um, i do work um, with a business colleague called sheena thompson so if you go to sheena thompson.com uh, you'll find me up there with my profile, but also Sheena and, uh, and see some of the work that we do there, but also see about Crisis Fit, which is which is her sort of COVID project, which is now uh, being launched and accredited training uh, in risk management, crisis management, and crisis communications. That's probably one of the best places to go. Brilliant. Mark, thank you very much. This is a pleasure. That was great. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Check out the show notes as usual and give Mark a follow or get in touch with him directly. Crisis preparedness and crisis management, I think, are trainable skills and something worth practicing and developing to some extent in both our professional and our personal lives. These are the kinds of skills that can certainly help us keep calm when things go awry. And at some point, unfortunately, they will. All right, if you enjoyed the episode and the show, please share it. If you have any thoughts or comments or suggestions, drop me an email at allthingsrisk at gmail.com. We'll be back very soon. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.